great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, you are spending your career going out and documenting what is happening firsthand with climate change, which is so important for people to realize how storms are getting worse and worse over time. And we need to change our efforts in our daily lives and work lives. We need to communicate that to our government and our companies. So I really appreciate all the, it's beautiful what you're doing with documenting, but it's also horrifying and scary. I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, no, thanks so much for having me. And, you know, it's always a, a topic I'm very passionate about. And I actually don't often get a chance to talk about because, uh, you know, it's not kind of a topic you just bring up randomly with friends or passers-by on the street. So, yeah, thanks for having me along today. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to chatting with you. Uh, it's awesome to have you. I don't think we've had any storm chasers on the show so <laughs> far. It's great to have your perspective. Um, there's so much I want to learn about the process, but let's talk a little bit about how you got interested in it, how you got started in this. I read a little bit about you working for the Discovery Channel at one point. Was that part of your transition to your own career? Well, it was right from the early days. This has always been a very much a, a passion-driven career. I, I started off as a hobbyist. I've always loved nature, the weather. I grew up in the countryside. You know, the weather's you know a big part of life when you live in in a rural, a rural part of the world. And obviously, living in England as well, we don't get much severe weather over there. It, it's pretty what I would describe flat and monotonous, the weather in the UK. So when it, whenever anything interesting did happen, you know, I was really into it. Um, and just, you know, the path one's life takes can be a bit random. I studied East Asian studies in university, and part of those studies took me to the heart of Typhoon Alley, which is Taiwan. Uh, and just as I was there on, on, on a scholarship studying Chinese, you know, the island started getting hit by a, a series of very strong typhoons. And that's when I really decided that this was something I wanted to witness more and try and document more, just the, the most ferocious storms on the planet. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, I, I also read a great article. Uh, you did an interview and uh, you were talking about uh, how some storm chasers uh, will be like excited and screaming and hollering, but that's not your style. And you're willing to, of course, put down your camera if people f are in need of help. Uh, you do take it very seriously. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I think for, for many people watching, they might just think it's an adrenaline junkie thing. Yeah, I I always say having a very basic common sense approach to storm chasing is one of the most important things when you if you're doing this kind of thing. You've always got to remember when you're deliberately putting yourself in a potential disaster zone that the community you're surrounded by or the community you're embedded with is is having, you know, the worst time in, you know, decades or ever. You know, people are dying. People's businesses and livelihoods are getting wrecked. Their homes are being destroyed or damaged. So, you know, that's the most important thing. And and you don't want to be a distraction when you're there. You don't want to be getting in the way. You don't want to be bothering people. You don't want to be taking up resources from, you know, the getting in the way of the rescue services. And all. So, you know, this is common sense. You know, you've just got to have an attitude like you're a guest in this area and you've got to behave respectfully. Um, and you've also got to have respect for the storm as well. So, you know, it's, it's just my style. Some people get a little overexcited. And, and I don't blame people for doing that when you're in the jaws of, of a powerful typhoon or, you know, a hurricane or witnessing a tornado. It is exciting. You know, the adrenaline is pumping. I'm not going to lie. There's, there is a buzz you get out of that. But there's so much more of a bigger picture going on at the same time, which is, which is far more important than one's own individual kind of thrill or, or buzz. Yeah, absolutely. And like I mentioned before, if people aren't seeing this extreme weather with good photos and video like you're capturing, um, it's hard to believe. It's hard to just look at a radar screen and take that in or look at the stats about how much damage and take that in. So people to experience what what's happening with extreme climate, they need to see it, right? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, I'm just thinking of the, the weather reports we all see when there's a big typhoon coming towards Japan or a hurricane in the US. You know, you've got the, the weather caster there and you've got a big satellite image and some other scientific data. But, you know, that has its uses. But for the average person who's not living in the area, which is threatened, is many hundreds of miles away and is not necessarily familiar with what these storms are capable of doing. I don't think that kind of imagery resonates much with them, which is why I think it is important that you have people on the ground who are documenting what is going on, uh, you know, documenting what I like to call a ground truth, which is accurate, timely reports of, of the situation on the ground. And then also for the historical record as well. And, and what I found, which is quite interesting, is a lot of the people in these communities, despite how traumatic these events can be, a, a major hurricane or a storm can obviously completely devastate a community. What I've noticed is many people really, really appreciate a thorough documentation of what's happened in their community, even if it's something horrific and, and traumatic. Definitely. Uh, before we dive in to more detail and your process and some of your year and examples of the extreme weather situations that you've covered in Japan and around Asia, uh, let's look at your video, your kind of trailer on your YouTube channel, which I think is, is great to give people an introduction of the kind of work that you do. So let's have a sure. look at that. 16 years, intercepting the world's wildest storms. Witnessing the beating pulse of planet Earth. Trying to capture the shots that truly define these terrifying forces of nature. And now the time has come to bring you along the ride. Amazing. Just incredible, Jay. Thanks for showing that. <laughs> Thanks for showing that. Yeah. But you're you're doing not only the all the photography and videography, but you're also doing all the editing yourself. It takes yeah. a lot of time, right? Yeah, I'm I'm completely a uh one man band, you know, most of the time. So um and just a, a little bit of context for that promo. Um that's that's kind of uh uh a promotional I don't know if that's the right word but that's more like a, a highlight for this new series I'm, I'm hoping to work on uh, post corona world when we can get out and you know get out of Japan and travel a bit more in the future um, but yeah I want to I really want to bring people along with me uh, and let people have kind of open the door and bring people along so they can get a real sense of what it's like to to chase these storms, film these volcanic eruptions. And it, it's kind of a separate venture to my work on the ground as the typhoon is happening. It, it's very different, but it, it's something I'm kind of excited to work on. So, yeah, it's kind of upping my filmmaking game is the plan going forward as well. Amazing. And you say that you focus on volcanoes typhoons and hurricanes and it's a perfect location for you to be positioned here in asia um is is that right like there's just so much happening around this asian region in terms of that focus yeah absolutely and as, as anyone knows who lives in japan this is a a, a land which is at the constant threat of a or an array of different uh you know natural hazards and disasters and that it's the same for many other countries in this region as well. Not only are we on like the the edge of the, the largest and warmest tropical ocean on the planet, which spawns more tropical storms and, and typhoons than anywhere else in the world. 
you know, we're sat on the, the, the Pacific's ring of fire subduction zone. So we've got the earthquake threat. And along with that, we have all the volcanoes as well. So yeah, there's, there's nowhere in the world, you know, Japan down to the Philippines that is as busy in terms of storms, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. This is where, you know, one of the world's biggest hotspots for all of that. Let's talk about volcanoes for a minute. Mm. Now, I have to ask, is that you in a fire suit heading <laughs> down in front of the volcano? Is it safe to go that, that close? That's a great, uh, that's not me. I was the one, I was working the camera and was happy to let someone else go down there and see what it was like. Uh, that was a good friend, Drew Bristow. He's a, he's a great climbing buddy of mine. Uh, He's an arborist, actually. So he uh, he he knows all about trees and, and climbing them and taking care of them. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was back in 2010 uh, on the beautiful South Pacific island of uh, uh, Ambrim, which is part of Vanuatu in the in the South Pacific. And they um, they had a back then they had a big boiling lava lake, which we were trying to, you know, I was part of a team trying to get up close to it and document it from right from the rim of the uh, the crater. I don't believe that lava lake is there anymore. There was a big eruption and then the whole kind of top of the mountain collapsed in on itself and buried it, which is very interesting. So, Wow, you have a gorgeous photo of that. So um, speaking of gear a little bit, what kind of cameras are you using? You use drones as well as other cameras, is that right? Yeah, I did. It, it's a, the gear thing is, is quite complicated and it's, it's something which is always evolving as... I, you know, my own approach to filming evolves as well. So in the past, I've been very much focused on using a kind of a bigger camera, you know, one you might see the some people at a, a wedding using to film a wedding video, kind of a medium sized thing about this big. But now I, I'm more in favor of being more mobile, getting a greater variety of shots. So that means using uh, smaller cameras and now the technology is has enabled these smaller cameras these days to shoot really really good video quality I'm talking you know the GoPros do I have one in front of me now well here's a GoPro 6 they've just released the 10 <laughs> so uh, this shot good video the 10 shoots really good video um, and even my you know the iPhone I specifically went ahead and bought the 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 honestly rather expensive iphone 12 pro whatever it is but it's a fantastic camera that is a work tool which i'm going to be shooting a lot of footage on in the future so was, you know in that respect it was worth every penny isn't that amazing that mobile phones can actually shoot such great video and can photography yeah movies? i've it's got amazing. a picture of your your camera bag so of course for some <laughs> things you have to waterproof GoPros are great because they're already waterproof. Is that right? Yeah. And the brilliant thing about the GoPro. So, yeah, you can you could throw it in a bathtub full of water and it'll be absolutely fine. But the real beauty of those as well, and this is something I'm trying to I've been playing around with for a few years with some success, but I really want to take it further is now the reason I have so many GoPros there is because I want to set these up as, uh, you know, like. I want to set them up in places where it would be far too dangerous for me to be set up as, you know, a human being, places where, you know, unsurvivable locations, basically, right on the shoreline as these big storms are rolling, a, as a, are rolling ashore to capture really dramatic, basically the wildest footage, which a human wouldn't be able to shoot. So they're kind of my expendable little army of cameras, which, you know, I can set up in these dangerous places. And if, you know, if they get washed away or broken, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So I'm really excited to see how that works when the, the next time I get into a very strong storm. I'm showing some of your Instagram feed right now as well. You, you don't only shoot extreme weather. You also have beautiful natural shots uh, from your travels around Japan. And that brings me to my next question about getting ready for a storm, following a storm, getting to the right location a few days before, uh, doing a scout around, seeing what route you might take once the storm hits. Can you walk us through the process a little bit? I found that really interesting when you were talking about the Ishigaki trip mm. that you did. Yeah, it's, it's part of the process, which just on a very personal level, I really enjoy, you know, 
you'll see my Twitter feed and I'll be posting crazy shots from the eye wall of a typhoon. But to get to that exact moment in time and the right location to do that, it's a quite a long and complicated journey, which usually starts between five to seven days beforehand. So I'll be keeping a very close eye on the weather forecasts. You know, most of us use, you know, the weather apps or just look at Yahoo weather. But behind the scenes of all that, there's a whole array of data which goes into producing these forecasts. So that's what I utilize. I go in and look at that kind of raw data, uh, which is being churned out by different supercomputers around the world and different governments and weather agencies. Uh, and using those tools, I get a good idea of whether there's a high chance that a hurricane or a typhoon is going to hit land somewhere. So I'll keep a very close eye on that. And then usually about 48 hours before a storm is due to hit land, that's when I'll kind of pull the trigger and decide to, you know, chase it. So I'll get wherever I need to get to. And then the final 24 hours is very much location scouting. You know, even 24 hours before a storm hit, there, there might be a, 100 150 kilometer stretch of coast which is in what we call the the uh the cone of error because our forecasts aren't 100 percent accurate of course so i just need to get to know wherever i am going to be filming the storm very well because that's the best way to keep safe is just to know exactly where all the safe spots to hide are or where the danger spots are places to avoid um and it's a process i really enjoy because i get to visit i'm privileged that i get to visit some remarkably stunning beautiful places especially here in asia where no one really would think to go to well at least i wouldn't you know not necessarily places i'll go on holiday so i'm just continually stumbling across these wonderful places and people of course um uh, when I'm on my travels doing this work. So I'm, I feel I'm very lucky in that respect. Uh, let's talk about Ishigaki and that, mm. that trip. Was it in July this year that you went there a few days before a storm was set to hit? Um, so you first flew into Okinawa and then you knew the storm was coming up to these islands and you had to choose which island and then go and get set up and you chose Ishigaki flying this tiny plane that we see on the screen here. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's it. It was, um, I, I call those chases island hopping chases. And, and again, just purely from a personal perspective, they are my favorite because, you know, you say to anyone, you want to hop around these beautiful tropical islands. It, it's, it's, it's as wonderful as it sounds. <laughs> it's, uh, and the Ryukus are, are, are glorious. I've, I've loved Okinawa. I've been chasing down there since 2005. Uh, I love it. It's beautiful. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was a typhoon called Infar back in late July this year. Uh, the unusual thing about that, it was a very slow moving storm. Usually storms just kind of trundle across the ocean at about 15 kilometers an hour, sometimes much faster. This one was really slow. So it meant I had to get onto the location well in advance uh, to get ahead of the bad weather before they close the airports and things like that. So I, I think my first stop was Okinawa. Then I did a very quick hop to Miyakojima, spent the night there, woke up in the morning and had a decision to make. Do I stay on Miyakojima? Or do I hop to Ishigaki, which islands, you know, I had to make a decision as to which island I thought was going to get the more severe impacts from the typhoon. It turned out the storm was so huge, the physical size of it, that Miyakojima and Ishigaki both got hit by it. So in the end, I chose Ishigaki and it was, um, you know, my first time to really get a chance to explore the island properly. And I highly recommend it. It's beautiful. Yeah, I love your, your photos uh, before the storm hits. And it's an interesting way to like have a travel blog, vlog, right? You're you're there in a beautiful time, and then you see this transition to severe weather. It's really interesting. Yeah, and that's something I want to highlight more going forwards. Uh, I've always shared that stuff on, on social media, but um, yeah, going forwards with this new vlog, kind of more filmy style I want to start incorporating into my videos. I really want to, you know, introduce these locations to the audience so that they can get a real sense of not only the, the vast array of different types of communities or, or places which get affected by tropical storms, but also learn how different communities 
deal with them. So, for example, the, the Ishigaki is probably one of the most well-prepared places in the world when it comes to dealing with typhoons, hurricanes, um, compared to many other places which I've worked in before and covered storms, which uh, unfortunately aren't very well geared up for them. So, um, you know, over the course of many future storms, hopefully I'll just be building up this this ever increasing library of films which really give people an understanding of what it's like not only to follow me filming the storms but what the places are like as well yeah they're, they're really, really interesting some of these places. really interesting and i i was interested in how uh when you arrive at the island you rent a car uh you drive around the island basically as much as you can to figure out which roads look maybe during the storm this would be a safe area to come back and document oh i'm definitely not coming to this road because this would be really dangerous can you talk about that a little bit i thought that yeah, was interesting. that's a that's a that's a great question um yeah storm chasing especially once the weather starts turning in and, and deteriorating it's it's a what i call a constant hazard assessment you're always on the lookout for things which are going to basically ruin your day. Uh, and and it's it's a, I think it's a skill you only really gain with experience and making mistakes. So I've really screwed up in the past and made bad decisions and got myself into situations which were frankly pretty dumb and I shouldn't have. I've learned from those. I will probably still make more dumb, silly decisions and mistakes in the future. It's just the way human nature is. But yeah, it, it's always a case of just looking out for where the obvious and not so obvious dangers are as well. So, you know, if you're driving in a typhoon, being on a road, which is you're surrounded by massive trees is obviously not such a good idea, but then you've also got to think about, are there any rivers around? What are the flash flood risks? Um, you know, it's, it's quite a complicated procedure. So um, I'm, again, that's another thing I'm trying to document, let people understand is just the, how multifaceted this whole storm chasing thing is and, and what goes into uh, just getting that eye wall shot, you know, at the end of it, all the work that goes in behind the scenes. Yeah. And I, I was interested also in your process. So uh, when you're resting in the hotel before you go out and document the storm, uh, you're talking about that being a really difficult time for you because you have to mentally prepare um, try to get your head in the game, but also you're worried about how it's going to go. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, um, and I, I think the, the older viewers and listeners will maybe, <laughs> you know, be able to understand this. Look, when I was chasing storms at 25, I, I didn't worry about much. I just got out there and did it. Now I'm 38. Um, you know, the older you get, the more things play in your mind. And, and more and more these days, I am chasing by myself. Um, and it can be pretty lonely on the road, especially now that I got young kids at home who I know miss me and I miss them massively. And the, the, the mental preparation and process that goes into filming these storms is certainly a lot more complex now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, but I find it really interesting. It's, it's almost like a game with your own mind because... There's times where I'll be chasing and I'll be utterly miserable. You know, I'm like, I hate this. Why am I here? I just want to be at home with my kids. As soon as the storm hits, all that disappears and I'm good. Get to work time. It's all over. I'm exhausted and like, oh, <laughs> just want to get home. And then as soon as I get home, I'm looking for where the next storm is. <laughs> Let's do that all again. It's, it's, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird kind of addiction. Uh, and I'm not sure what part of the process I'm addicted to. Maybe it's just getting over the the challenges of it. I don't know. It's, it's I should maybe speak to a psychologist about it all because I think it's quite interesting. Well, I wanted to ask you because you are sharing so much on social media. Your social media channels are so popular, but you're also selling footage to networks that buy yeah. your stock footage and, and use in their news programs. So... Are you getting enough in terms of the social credit back from your audience uh, saying, great job, this is awesome, but also oh. financial support? Is this a worthwhile career? Is this something you can sustain? 
<laughs> Great question. First of all, I have so many wonderful followers. Twitter is my main kind of social media. And then the YouTube is obviously my video broadcasting platform. But, you know, I've got so many wonderful supportive followers on Twitter and they do mean the world to me because for me, when the going gets tough on the road, all I need to do is go onto Twitter and look at some of the replies to my tweets and the encouraging positive messages I get from people. And I'm really lucky as well, because I would say 99.5% of the engagements I get on Twitter is positive stuff. I'm very lucky in that respect. I don't trolls all the horrible negative people who, who, you know, these days kind of infest social media. They don't seem to have had me in their sites yet. And I hope that continues. Um, but I'm really thankful for, for all the support I get. It does mean a lot. Um, and yeah, on the, on the, obviously I'm running a business as well. So the, the primarily that is, you know, licensing footage. If, if someone wants to use my footage and they're going to use it for a commercial purpose, I'm not going to give it away for free. So I'll, I'll charge for that. And, and that is the basis of how I'm able to do all this, you know, running a successful production company, though I have to say the last two years have been pretty challenging, not being able to shoot because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and during this downtime, uh, when it's so difficult to travel, uh, it must be very difficult to even get out outside of Japan to nearby Indonesia or other Asian countries. It's just so difficult getting in yeah. and out of the country. But uh, you have done some trips like down to Okinawa or uh, around uh, Japan's islands. Um, but that that's a big part of your job is being able to fly around to where the storm is, right? Yeah, you know, I've missed probably, you know, four years worth of development, personal growth, shooting opportunities just because I've not been able to travel. But look, you know, bigger picture. Yes, the pandemic has been tough for my work, but I'm I'm lucky, you know, I'm one of the very, very lucky ones. I'm able to just cruise through it and come out the other side and be like, right, I'm hitting the road and I'm going at it even harder than I was beforehand. A lot of people, and I'm very mindful of this when I, I, I moan about my personal struggles during the pandemic, that there are, they are not as serious as many people who have been completely wiped out, lost their livelihoods, got sick, you know, so... For that, I'm very thankful. And I, what I've been trying to do is harness this, all this negativity that's been around over the last year and a half and really try and channel that into like positive energy for the future, so to speak. So I've got all these plans. I've been brainstorming all these ideas for this new series, different places I want to go to once, you know, we can travel and the pandemic is more or less we're living with it safely. Um, so yeah, that's just been my personal coping mechanism. And obviously I've got a beautiful family and they're my rock, you know, without them, it would be a lot tougher. So I'm excited about the future. I'm just so eager to hit the road. <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, you, you talk about your family and, and taking your kids uh, to help you document the, the safer uh, extreme weather situations, but they must be very interested in what you're doing. Yeah, this is the first year where they've started to really show uh, uh, an organic interest in what I'm doing. I, I, I'm not the type of person, who, I, I don't want to force my interests on my kids, but I'll certainly let them be very aware of what I'm doing and, you know, the places I'm going and what I'm shooting and showing them the footage. So if they decide that they're interested in this kind of thing, then, yeah, I'll do everything I can to to enable them to witness these things because i think nature for kids is so vitally important and so many kids lack access to nature and exposure to nature i think it really helps ground you as a human being and appreciate the the wider world and the environment we live in and how fragile and important it is so this is why, you know, I'm not talking about the storms and stuff like that with the kids, but just the basic stuff, you know, bugs, being in the forest, playing in the rivers, stuff like that. So um, when they get a little bit older, I'll graduate them slowly up to, you know, a typhoon, which is a few hundred miles offshore and the waves are big and then step it up slowly with their mother's permission, of course. 
it was it was fun to see uh, one of the shots of I think one of your kids holding an umbrella, stepping into the wind, and you're like, good technique uh, there, <laughs> good good step work. Yeah, <laughs> That's you got to have some it. fun with it. You got to have some fun. <laughs> Um, I've had this picture of the mangroves in Ishigaki up on screen because I wanted to mention how uh, you pointed out in the video that this mangrove area is where people dock their boats. And it's actually a very wonderful natural protection for a lot of the island. And I think this is, we know around the world, mangroves are in danger and need to be brought back. They offer so much protection for people living in these areas and it, it was nice to see that in your video yeah that's why when i i stumbled across that that mangrove forest i was not only quite surprised because i was not something i was expecting to see but also just knew this is such a cool example of 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 evolution and nature you know just an, the way that nature develops uh, and gives us this gift so to speak it, it, mangroves are amazing for those who aren't necessarily familiar um hurricanes typhoons often produce what is a, a, called storm surge and it, it's the deadliest usually the deadliest and most dangerous phenomena associated with these storms most people think oh it's the crazy wind but no it's it's the seawater which usually causes the most damage and kills the most people and these mangroves act literally as this brilliant protective like a spongy seawall i suppose is the best way to describe them um to protect coastlines and communities which are behind the mangroves that they, they absorb all the energy of the storm surge and and anyone who's behind them you know is gonna be kept much safer and this is especially true in places like i, I believe in bangladesh and parts of india which are very very high risk storm surge zones and they have very, very important mangrove, very large mangrove areas there, which um, they're, I think they're trying to protect or, or try and expand because, you know, there really is no better protect, protection against, uh, you know, the dangers of the ocean during a, a typhoon or a hurricane. Definitely. And I've been um, listening to Ocean Impact Organization in Australia, and they're talking about how coral reefs are also really important in breaking um, the waves as they come in. Yeah. Um, Japan is very fond of these concrete uh, blocks, like they look like jacks, which are put as breakers, but apparently natural coil um, mangroves is so much more effective in stopping the storms from doing so much damage. I'm, I'm showing uh, this picture of the beach in Ishigaki. Of course, if you have an island in front of your beach, that's going to help as well. But this beach that you went to in Kumejima, it's a very typical view in Japan along the coastline with so much concrete. Have you noticed this when you're doing your storm chasing, documenting uh, like a natural breakage versus the concrete breakage? Have you noticed any differences? Absolutely. Uh, and that's a really interesting point you raise because the concrete or where I say where humans have manipulated the coastline are usually the spots I'm looking for to film because that's where you get the most dramatic clash of what we humans have built versus nature. And usually that's where it's quite dramatic, you know, huge waves crashing into concrete, splashing, blowing in the wind. You don't get those shots when there's mangroves or or uh, a coral reef, because all that action is going on, you know, 200 meters offshore, well away from the coastline where we are. So, yeah, and there, there is a lot of that, especially in Okinawa, the main island, um, and, you know, throughout the whole island chain. Um, you know, I'm not sure, obviously, you know, the, the small fishing harbors and everything, I, I guess they need some sort of additional protection, but it, it's all about striking the right balance. and usually we're not very good at finding that right balance are we unfortunately um, i i just did a an introduction of uh teshima in kagawa prefecture and mm -hmm. how the local communities have asked the government to take away the concrete that they have put along the coastline that they want to get back to their natural coastline view as a part of not only their better quality of life, but tourism appeal. And I thought that was a really interesting 
change that you don't often hear in Japan, but I could imagine these beautiful islands in Okinawa doing something similar. Yeah, I would, um, I, it's certainly something I would welcome, you know, and obviously the, the Japan, we have the, the tsunami threat as well. It's the ocean is, you know, you know, 999 days out of a thousand, it's beautiful, tranquil and, and, and wonderful. But then you get that one day where it's the most terrifying force, force of nature there is, you know, and, and as I said, it's finding that balance. I've seen what they're, they're doing up in Tohoku as well, um, an area I'd love to travel and see for myself more. But, you know, in the response to the terrible events in 2011 and I, I just don't know how I feel if, if that's sustainable or in the long term is the right way to go about it. Just concreting off and sealing off the whole coastline. I, I can't, can't help but feel there might be, just be a better way to coexist with the ocean. You know, I, it's not, I'm not saying I have the answers, but I just feel it's, there's something a little off about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm showing your your beautiful uh, some of your pictures from the videos that you did in Ishigaki and Okinawa, and I love that at the end of the storm, sometimes you are blessed with this amazing sunset. Yeah, this is this is something we get to see quite often. Actually, yeah, that one in Ishigaki was probably the most spectacular one I've ever seen, and I've I've chased a lot of storms. Um, very quick science lesson <laughs> it's uh it's fabulous you know the juxtaposition between the violence at the around the center of the storm and then on the periphery you have this absolute beauty but basically what that is is you know if you've got an old car you've got the exhaust fumes coming out of the back well basically the engine of the typhoon is right in the middle of it and that very very high cloud is the exhaust all the air being blown away from the center of the storm in the form of very high clouds, which are cirrus clouds. And um, you get a lot of the cirrus, you know, covering the whole sky. And then when the sun just hits the right angle and just illuminates those clouds, either at sunrise or sunset, you just get the most spectacular typhoon uh, or hurricane sun sunset. Uh, they're amazing. Wow. And it must make it at least most of it worth it, even though it's scary documenting such a, a crazy storm. Uh, speaking of science, I appreciate all the, the little tips you give in your videos as well. So in this, uh, you've got some serious wind and rain howling <laughs> into your face, um, but you teach us where we can find the location of the storm. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, this is, um, thanks for bringing that up, because that's actually one of the central tenets of this new series I'm, I'm, I'm working on and going to produce is I really, really want it to be educational. You know, I want people to watch a video and have learned something, whether it's about the storm or the location or just the whole process. Um, you know, and very fa fa I want it to be family friendly as well, so you won't find any swearing or anything like that for all age groups. But yeah, I, I really, you know, if you're going to be making engaging content, you know, I think people need to be, as they say, either entertained or learning something. And I'm going to try and find the right balance between both of those because uh, I do want them to be, you know, interesting, entertaining vi videos, but also, you know, useful as well. I want the whole series to be useful, not just, a, oh, look at me, I'm chasing storms <laughs> adventure. I don't want it to just be that. But you do have to turn the camera on yourself and and take some yeah. some of the the brunt of the storm to to show people how strong it is because just looking at a tree, just looking at the waves, it doesn't have the same emotional power as seeing someone caught in the storm. And oftentimes that has to be you because you're the yeah. only one there, right? <laughs> yeah, that's something I've been a little bit hesitant to do in the past. I've been very much focused on, right, unless I'm just doing a specific update for Twitter where I need to do a piece to camera to explain what's going on. I've much preferred to be with my cameras, you know, hidden from the elements while shooting them. But you're, you're spot on. Um, and actually, you know, viewer feedback like you've just given me is, is really valuable. Uh, and I do feel it. I'm going to have to immerse myself a little bit more in the elements just so the, the audience can, yeah, as you said, get a real feel for, 
for what it's like at that moment in time as the, the wind is ripping off the ocean or the, the waves are crashing or whatever. But look, I, again, I, I probably need to put a, you know, a warning. Do not try this at home. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty cautious, safe storm chaser. So, um, yeah, it's about finding the right balance and, and getting in the elements for trying to do it safely and get the point across sensibly. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more about safety and gear in a minute. Um, but I, I don't want to miss this point that you mentioned in the video. When you're looking for where the storm is coming from, you look directly into the wind and then 90 degree oh, angle yeah. to the side. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So if you're in the um, the wind in a hurricane or typhoon in the northern hemisphere, uh, rotates anti-clockwise around the center. So that means if you're facing into the wind, uh, you stick your arm out 90 degrees to the right, then you'll know exactly where the center of the storm is. You won't necessarily know which direction it's going in, but you'll just know the storm is out that way. Now, obviously, if you're in Australia or Fiji or Madagascar, it's the opposite because in the southern hemisphere, they spin uh, clockwise, just like the the water in your bathtub when you pull the plug out. So stick your hand out to the left and then you'll know where the storm is. So, and that's actually can be quite useful if you're trying to fit. I actually use this technique when I'm trying to figure out which direction the wind is going to be hitting a certain location. That's something you need to figure out, like where do I need to hide the car so it's protected from the wind or when is this area of coast going to get hit by the onshore wind and the waves? So yeah, it's, it has its practical uses as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it, it's definitely something that I think a lot of your viewers are interested in. So all these little tidbits um, from science that you're learning along the way. So you're not just a photographer and videographer, you're an educator as well yeah. in what you're doing. Yeah. That, I, that, if, you know, if, if people start seeing me that way, I, I'll be really happy because that's kind of what I would like to start doing as well is just really, you know, giving people the opportunity to learn some pretty random stuff about these storms that you might not necessarily see in a Discovery Channel documentary or just learn in the classroom. Yeah. I think there's, uh, let's talk about safety a little bit because I mm. think there's a lot of people that might be really interested in trying to document an, a storm coming into their area. When you're in really strong wind, for example, are you using like a rope to tie you to a pole or something so you don't blow away? Uh, you mentioned parking in a safe place. Are there other safety precautions that you're always thinking about before you set up in an area? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and it's an important topic to talk about now look i'm never gonna like t wag my finger or tap people you know people who are interested in going out and experiencing storms if they don't have any experience in it you know it's human nature to be curious and and want to try and experience something which is very rare and you might not have experienced before but yeah it's i, I think there's a central kind of point which we we have about keeping safe it's very simple it's hide from, run from run from the water hide from the wind sorry so run from the water means basically keep away from areas where you know the water could kill you so that might be the immediate shoreline next to a big river or somewhere you know which could be hit by landslides so make sure you're not there and then hide from the wind essentially means just keep yourself in a strong building away from the wind but obviously you know, it's a little more complicated than that, uh, especially if you're out there trying to, to document the storm and, uh, and you know, get images and experience it a little bit. I just, it's not something I would recommend. You know, once winds, I think a common misconception is that, oh, you know, we're a lot, we can deal with stronger winds a lot easier than you might expect. Like, it doesn't take much wind to hurt you. Let's just put it that way. So um, you just don't take for, don't underestimate the power of the storms, I, I think is the most uh, in, important aspect. So I'm losing my train of thought slightly because <laughs> it is quite oh, a complex okay. uh, thing. Um, I'm just so trying to think about what, the, what did I say wind, to someone? With the wind, like even a small, 
a piece of dirt because the wind yeah. is moving so fast or even a raindrop in your eye can really be painful yeah. at least yeah right? look when it, very even very very small things flying around in the typhoon can can cause you a bad day you know that you've got to be careful of windows if glass breaks i've i've had that danger before when you know windows smashing and you got glass flying through the air you know tree branches you got uh you know you roof tiles in, all in those kind Osaka, of things some uh metal siding from buildings were flying around and... yeah that was crazy there was so much debris that was typhoon jebby in 2018 in early september i think it was um yeah and that was a very powerful storm and you could see from all the footage we saw that, that there were literally hundreds and thousands of people who were underestimating the power of the storm and they were out in their little k trucks or whatever flipping over pizza delivery guys getting blown around i'm up you on know. the northeastern tip there's <laughs> classic examples of of people underestimating the power of the storms and getting getting out of their depth so you know, even if it's just a category one typhoon, I that, doesn't sound very strong. Put a second Kestrel unit up here. that can, uh, you know, that can, you know, even, even the weaker storms can, can cause you serious problems. Yeah. Um, so do you ever wear goggles? I was wondering that because some of your footage, even the raindrops look so painful coming into your face, like is a mask or goggles, is that useful? Yeah, it is useful. And I'll probably start doing that going forward, especially if I'm going to be putting myself in the elements a little bit more. It's it's a lot, a lot of storm chasers use them for good reason. You know, raindrops hitting you in the eye at, at 60 kilometers an hour can really hurt, <laughs> as as uh, as I referenced in that my last video. But um, yeah, go goggles are useful. Um, helmet I usually wear as well in the stronger typhoons. So you know, just basic safety precautions. And then, like I asked before, I think, do you ever use a tow line, like a climbing rope or anything? No, because I think that would just be, you know, if you're needing that, then it's probably getting too dangerous to be outside and the, the threat of, of debris and things would be would be too great. And I, I'm traveling solo. That's just too much gear to bring. Rope, ropes and stuff, it's heavy. I need to, you know, 30 kilograms is basically my allowance of what I can bring. So I've got to really pick and choose what gear to, to leave behind and what bring what gear to take. So Yeah, that makes sense. I I'd, just shout out to some of our listeners. Uh, we've got Kevin O'Shea says, fantastic oh, conversation. <laughs> Enjoyed listening to James. He's got a pretty exciting job. Uh, Molly in Haps is saying beautiful photos. Uh, Peter gave an award. Great interview. Thanks so much, guys. It's great to have you here. And Thank you so uh, people much. warning uh, Louise Poppy, please don't do any storm chasing. She's a, a live stream travel guide. So, <laughs> so, well, if you do, just be safe, please. <laughs> <laughs> No, th thank you for the comments and um, shout out to Kevin who left one. Kevin's been a tremendous supporter of my work over the years and, and a really good friend. And I've, I've learned a lot from him about uh, the the natural world in Japan and, and um, a lot of things. So, yeah, good to see you here, Kevin. Thanks for, for watching. That's awesome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, gear. So you you often refer to watching the radar or watching uh, storms, what what services are you using? Are you using special apps to help you uh, kind of document where the storm is going or to, <laughs> to kind of predict where you should be? There's almost, there's, all many, there's almost too many sources of information these days. So when I'm on a storm, you know, my Safari browser will have about 20 tabs open with all sorts of different <laughs> kind of data points. Um, but yeah, the main things when, you know, if you're facing down a, a, a typhoon, the, the most important things you need are really, I think, the satellite imagery. So the view from space, uh, the radar imagery, which is kind of the view through the clouds, just looking at the rain, which you can see in the bottom right of the screen there. Uh, that gives you a really detailed, close look of where the nastiest parts of the storm are. You know, a typhoon or a hurricane, it isn't just this uniform donut of horrendous weather there's 
you know, very specific changes and variances within within each storm. Each storm is very unique and and you know, no one, not not one storm is like another. Um, so that gives us a really good idea of all right, so we got a couple of hours where it's not going to be too bad before it gets hellish, or you know, it's a very, very useful tool. Um and then different forecasts from Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong. There's all these these different countries and, and territories around the region have their forecasts. And then there's the raw weather data. There's a lot. There's, <laughs> there's a lot. So um, it's all about juggling and trying to interpret all that and cutting out the noise and finding what's most useful. Yeah. I, in terms of volcanoes, uh, do you also have to look at the air air quality index or anything? That's a that's a great question, and and usually with the types of volcanoes which I'm shooting in Asia, where we're talking about volcanoes doing that bottom right exploding. So when it comes to dealing with those types of volcanoes, I'm very much keeping my distance from them. You don't want to be too close to to a volcano when it explodes like that because that thing is chucking you know, huge chunks of lava, maybe one or two kilometers from, from the crater. Um, so because you've got that bit of that distance, you don't really need to worry about poisonous gases and things like that, as opposed to say, if you're walking straight up to a lava flow in Hawaii or what's going on in uh, the Canary Islands right now in La Palma, uh, or even in Iceland uh, over the spring, uh, they're very different types of eruptions. So they both have their challenges and dangers but more so with the the volcanoes i'm filming I, I'm, I'm keeping a respectful distance so i don't necessarily need to carry a gas mask or but usually a decent mask to filter out the volcanic ashes is uh is what i need to to wear do you do you ever also like put any protective coating on drones um before you send them up into the atmosphere i was i was listening to Someone who's using drones to get whale snot the oh, other wow. way. <laughs> and so she has to, you know, make sure the drones are waterproof. And it's not something I ever thought of that drones are not usually waterproof. So there must be some kind of preparation you also need to do, right? Well, thankfully, um, I have flown one drone right into some quite heavy ash. And it, it was okay, you know, because it's it's pretty dry. And, and and luckily most of the ash just manages to kind of get blown away from the drone through the propellers and and any stuff which does get in there it, it kind of gets ground up so it's so far i haven't had any drone crashes due to ash but i have crashed drones because of other things like big waves and stuff so um but yeah the, the volcanic ash is very nasty stuff you know it's it's not going to poison you but you do need to take precautions against it because it's Volcanic ash isn't really like rock. It's more like ground up glass. So if you get a lot of that inside your lungs, it's not going to do you any any good at all. So um, that's always the mo one of the things I'm very mindful about. So I always have a mask on when I'm when I'm around exploding volcanoes. Yeah, definitely. And being right up and personal with all these extreme weather conditions. Does it make you more empathetic for people who are living in these areas, you think? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, what I do find very interesting um, is what I call like the hurricane or typhoon culture. Because people who live on the islands, you know, I see this very much in the in the Ryukus, in Taiwan, uh, in, in the Philippines, you know, typhoon season is very much woven into the, the, the fabric of the community and the culture there. It, it's something they've you know, lived with for generations, especially in these rural areas where you have people or, you know, families who have been settled there for, for many, many generations. Um, and I, I do find that really interesting. And it, it's it's something they've learned to live with. And it's the same with volcanoes as well. You know, it, it, it's like the dominant force of nature that exists in that area. And there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of respect for that and understanding. And, you know, I can learn a lot from these people as well, because different communities have different ways and little tricks and tips for dealing with and getting through these storms. Um, so it, it's very interesting. And again, that's the kind of thing I'd like to showcase more as well going forward to, to, to educate and teach people. 
Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned about the mangroves as a, a natural protection for local people and, and the, the land. Um, I also, I interviewed a journalist who had researched some indigenous cultures and some of their straw huts were actually more resistant to major weather events than modern buildings. Have you noticed any like indigenous knowledge? You touched on that a little bit. That's, um, um, in other ways. that's very interesting you mentioned that because uh, that's something anecdotally that I have noticed in the past, especially in, in the Philippines where a lot of people, you know, certainly low income people have very basic, almost like hut, like houses and some of them i've noticed in the past have stood up to the wind far better than you'd expect you know you see a small thatched hut and you'd think oh that thing doesn't stand a chance yet after a massive typhoon many of them are still standing you know and the, the structure is intact yeah there might be a little bit of roof damage or something but um it goes back to the point of these people you know they're dealing with typhoons every year year in year out for decades 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 so they know what they need to do to keep themselves safe and their property safe and usually i guess it's the you know outsiders move in i think this is a problem in the the us especially in florida there's concern there that a lot of out of staters have moved in they don't necessarily have this ingrained understanding of hurricanes and the threat they pose uh, so when the next big one does come along, it, it you know, there's going to be a lot of people in for a rude awakening. That's a good point. Yeah. And people not used to um, how to handle or common sense of certain people who have yeah. always lived there is, even, is lacking if you just move in somewhere new, right? Yeah. Or even just like building your house on the beach. You know, you as I goes back to the point I said earlier, 999 days, it'll be a beautiful place. But that one day where it all goes wrong you know it to just wipe everything out so it's yeah, yeah it's, it's always balancing risks uh but i think you know we can learn a lot from these you know these these people who live and face this threat year in year out i think there's um and i i, I want to talk to these people more i'm desperate to get out there and talk to people you know um in these in these different communities and countries yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from indigenous knowledge, not only about diet, longevity, uh, styles of houses to live in, but also how to survive extreme weather. They've been doing it in, in much less modern facilities for a lot longer than we have. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, James. Is there anything we haven't talked about or anything you have coming up that you want to give a shout out to? No, no, I just, um, I would just love to give a shout out. And this is going to sound a bit cheesy, but I just want to give a, a huge shout out to all my followers on YouTube, uh, followers on Twitter, subscribers on YouTube, just for sticking with me over the last two years where I haven't been doing much work. You know, I really appreciate it. There's big things to come. Uh, as soon as Japan drops quarantine for us uh, residents here and we, we can leave and come back without the rigmarole of of staying at home for two weeks or however long it is uh i will be hitting the road hard uh there's going to be new new content there's going to be new ways i'm doing my work so i i'm i'm excited about that you know i think uh i refuse to be ground down by this pandemic and i'm going to try and make determine that I'll, I'll come out of this better and with new and exciting things so and then thank you for having me for having me on today and having the 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 chance to chat and I, I love your work as well and what you do. It's, it's amazing. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, people can find you and your amazing work on YouTube and Twitter and Instagram. Those and then your website as well, right? Yeah, I think uh, stay away from the website. <laughs> it needs some work. But yeah, if the Twitter, YouTube, a little bit of Instagram, that's where Earth Uncut TV, that's where you'll find what I'm what I'm up to. And it's it's a happy place most of the time. It's pretty nature pictures. There's no politics or anything. It's it's I want it to be a place where people can, you know, learn and see some nice pictures and 
I've loved, I've loved your pictures of, of Nagano sunflowers and poisonous yeah. snakes and getting, <laughs> getting out to nature in Japan as well. So it's, it's not just extreme weather. You have some great travel gems in there as well. <laughs> and uh, just a big thanks to everyone who's been watching and commenting as well. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. Yeah, Louise says, uh, we are all waiting. And thank you so much, James and Joy. We are all going the way with the website. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it needs some work. <laughs> I think um, that's so true, though. Like you said, with the, the new cell phone being so, so great for photography or video. And then it's just so easy to just do social media. But yeah. from a cell phone, it's very hard to update your website. So I feel that way too. Like the website kind of doesn't get as much attention, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's not so. Pre my 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 website is more. It's more for like the business side of things. It's where I send, you know, TV producers, news networks, and things like that. So I, th I think for people wanting storm imagery or updates on stuff, that it, 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 there wouldn't be much of interest there. Yeah. Yeah, well, there, the there's a great, there. it's, it's like a great history of all your, your past work, though, all the yeah. storms that you've documented and stuff. That is quite yeah. interesting. And yeah. give some credibility, Louise says. Good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, that, that's on the to-do list. And that, that list is growing longer by the day. <laughs> by the days go on. Well, enjoy your downtime, you know. I, yeah, and thank you. Yeah, and uh, enjoy your time with family and uh, stay safe when the storms do thank come you. back. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to hanging out on, on Twitter as we as we do. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thanks James. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>